So, and, and so those last questions were actually a, a wonderful segue uh, to, to Ms. Kelly McBride about the, the ethics uh, of this issue. Uh, last winter about this time, I, I came across an announcement uh, about the media reporting guidelines on mass shootings and was um, in a way that people who do my work maybe only can be, was, was actually sort of tickled and delighted to see that coming. Uh, and heard a, a wonderful webinar with uh, Ms. McBride talking about these issues. Uh, Kelly McBride is the editor of The New Ethics of Journalism, Principles for the 21st Century, one of the newer and better books on media ethics. She's been the vice president of the Pointer Institute since 2014 and faculty uh, since 2002, a center that provides uh, continuing training, education, and policy leadership to advance ethical and effective journalism, uh, and most importantly, has been their department leader on journalism ethics. Uh, of interest, she began her career in journalism uh, as a beat reporter for the Spokane Review, uh, covering the, the very interesting uh, areas of both the crime beat as well as the religion and ethics beat. Um, she can be heard regularly on the Everyday Ethics podcast and the bi-weekly radio segment, Making Sense of the Media. Uh, Ms. Kelly McBride. It says I can go. Hi, how are you all? Um, this is like the last session of someone talking at you, and I'm very sorry that I have to be the person to do this. Um, this, has been, um, this has been a wonderful experience for me. Um, you guys are all very wonky and statistical, um, and that's not who I usually deal with, um, and it's, it's quite delightful and fun. However, I think if we're going to be effective we need to move out of our wonky existence and into the real existence of the public and look at how people are consuming information, what's happening in our news ecosystem, why journalism happens the way it happens, um, where we've effectively changed journalism in the past, and what we, can, what we can learn from those lessons and apply to this particular conundrum. So um, let's see here. I'll just, so now I can't move the slides. <laughs> well there, if I, I guess if I, let me see here. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so how you can help. So, so let's talk a little bit first about truths versus truth, right? Because what we're after is truth with a capital T and what journalism does is truths with a little T and an S at the end. So. In any given newsroom, as you cover violence, you cover violence like this. What happened yesterday? Who did it happen to? Where did it happen? That's what journalism is. And what consumers learn are the basics of Journalism 101, that who, what, where, when, why. Who was shot? Where did it happen? What's the condition of the victim? What's the status of the shooter? And the, the real thing to remember here is that when journalists cover these stories, they're doing it because you, the public, want to know, will this happen to me? Right? And we have more evidence than ever about what you, the public, are interested in by the internet. We can see what you click on. And so we know that in these store, in, in a, especially in a local setting, these stories get a lot of traction. Now the question that we don't know is, if we really gave serious, um, substantive alternatives and we could give it the same treatment that we give these stories, would that change the public's reaction? Um, but the journalistic motivation behind those stories is public safety. And that's very much, journalists cover stories because they believe them to be relevant to the audience. And public safety is one of the highest motivations. How do I keep myself safe? How do I keep my children safe? How do I keep my car from getting stolen? How do I keep people from breaking into my house? How do I not get sick? Public, like immediate public safety. That's, what, that's one of the things that motivates journalism. But when you're talking about truth with a capital T and no S at the end, you're really talking more about a different type of coverage. 
And journalism does some of this coverage, right? The New York Times did this fabulous story about the connection between the availability of guns and suicide. It's a fabulous, fabulous trend piece. And of course, we've seen, um, we've seen Mark's work um, with Mother Jones and the database that he created and how revealing that is. Um, We've seen his work here. And then, and then there's, a, there's other databases. So USA Today created a different database. They took the word public out of the um, description of mass shootings and just did all the mass shootings, came up with, with a much greater number. And that's because if you use the FBI definition, which at one point was four or more people dead and is now three or more people dead, most of those are not public at all. They're people who, where the shooter knows his or her victims and is related to them. Um, and um, they kill a lot of children also. What do consumers learn when we do those stories? Well, they learn, they get a big picture. It's sort of the difference between being on the dance floor and in the middle of the action and being on the balcony and looking at the broader issue. Um, they get a much bigger picture about what's happening, they understand why it's happening, and they also get a little bit of information about what is likely to happen in the future. But very little of that is applicable specifically to an individual's life. And there you have the conundrum, right? Journalism has to get you to click on the story. And if the story is not applicable to your life today, you are unlikely to click on that story. So this, this, is a, this is a broader social problem. But if we could get journalism to be a little more motivated about public health, I think we might move the needle a little bit. Because ultimately, our goal here in this conversation is a more educated and informed public that can then influence public policy. Right? That's, that's our end goal. And journalism plays a role in that. It's not the only actor, but it plays a significant role in that. So let me tell you a little bit about how I got here and why I'm making some of these conclusions. Um, Jack said um, that I was a reporter for years before I went to work at the Pointer Institute, which is a nonprofit school that trains journalists the world over. Um, our goal, our mission, if you will, is to elevate journalism in service of democracy. And that um, democracy at the end of that sentence is the most important word there. Um, so I was a um, police reporter for years. Years. I worked in Cleveland. I worked in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I worked in Spokane, Washington. And I did the job that police reporters do when you go to the police station, usually many police stations every day, and look through stacks and stacks of reports. Um, and I noticed that there were a lot of stories that we didn't cover. There were certainly a lot of stories about sexual abuse that we never covered. There were a lot of stories about suicide that we never covered. Um, there, were, there were things that were just off limits. And suicide was in particular off limits. And it was off limits because of an unwritten actually sometimes written, but often unwritten set of rules. And the rules were, don't cover suicide. Originally, it wasn't because it leads to contagion, which we know that coverage of suicide can do that now. It was because it was shameful, because there was a stigma associated with it. Because if your spouse or your kid or your father killed himself, there must be something wrong with your family. It was a societal view, and we wanted to protect people who didn't deserve that stigma from, from enduring it. That was what motivated us. It was not a public health issue. Now, later, in more like the 2000s and on, we became, we, we became a little more aware of that in journalism and um, started um, saying, well, don't cover suicide because it leads to contagion. But still, that's such a crappy way to address the issue because suicide is a massive public health issue and if we don't cover it, then how are people going to know how to prevent it? And it is preventable. So, um, and then the other thing that I realized about this don't cover suicide rule is that there were all of these exceptions. The major one was, unless it's in a public place, like if somebody jumps off a bridge and disrupts traffic, well you gotta tell people why the traffic is backed up. 
So there was that exception. But then there was also the, well, if it's a public person, you should also cover it because then it's news, right? It's relevance. So you can see as a decision-making tree how journalism creates a standard and then creates all these exceptions, so much so that really there's no standard at all. And that's really because then the other um, type of suicide story that I noticed was that if it's just a really good story, we're going to find a way to cover it. Now, this is inherent in a profession, this sort of decision making is inherent in a profession that is unlicensed. And we are unlicensed by design in order to keep democracy healthy. Right? We believe that journalism has to be unlicensed. It's written into the First Amendment because we don't want the government to decide who can be a journalist and, and, and who can exercise their First Amendment rights or restrict their First Amendment rights. Um, we believe that everybody should be able to be a journalist. So there's no, there's, there's, there's no real mechanism for changing these rules on an effective, efficient level. They exist and they happen and they're, they're, they're badly thought out and badly applied. And because we don't have a licensing procedure, there's no, there's no way to get at it. Now there used to be more effective ways because it used to be that through professional associations, you could influence large swaths of journalists, either like the television journalists through RTDNA or the um, newspaper editors through ASNE. But increasingly, those organizations have become weaker and weaker because we can't even figure out now who a real professional journalist is because there's so many outlets and, and such a proliferation of organizations and individuals who are publishing into the widely distributed marketplace of ideas. So, um, so. Given all of that, I, when I looked at those, that, that problem of suicide, and I also did a lot of research on sexual assault, can you change the way journalists approach a topic? You can't do it by regulation, because there is no regulation. You also can't do it by peer pressure these days. You used to be able to in the old days. But these days, for every journalist who says, oh, you shouldn't do that, you've got a journalism organization like Vice or BuzzFeed that is like, well, screw you. That's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to build our brand on, on, on being against all of the mores that our old newspaper brethren stand for. So you can't do it by peer pressure. Um, but what you can do is you can tap into the core values of journalism. And that's how both around sexual assault and suicide, I've worked with journalism organizations to develop better practices. So if you, I, I work with journalists the world over, and I often ask journalists, why did you become a journalist? And inevitably, the answer is to make the world a better place. Journalists are motivated to go into the profession because they see it as a place where you can address issues of injustice. And so we worked on these reporting on suicide.org, these, these guidelines. And instead of saying, don't cover suicide, um, what we say is, cover suicide in a way that educates the public. And we give some very specific examples. And we have created a similar one for reporting on mass shootings that Jack referenced. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail. Um, but I will say that what isn't workable is creating rules that would, that would force journalists to like, not publish the names of shooters. Um, it won't work because the First Amendment guarantees that you can't you would, it would have to be a voluntary enforcement. And in this proliferation of outlets, you could never get unanimous consent. There will always be someone to publish, to publish the names. And we see that even with um, sexual assault victims. Anytime there is a sexual assault victims who, whose name has been protected, there are plenty of places on the internet where you can find that name. So. Also, I think when you come up with these rules, when you come up with rules that say, don't do this, you end up creating in the public this sort of Voldemort effect. 
you actually give more power to the name by putting a rule around it that says, well, we're just not going to say it. Um, in addition to that, um, when we talk about not naming rape victims, um, and we talk about not covering suicide or other, um, other topics where there is, a, there is a fairly unanimous voluntary adherence to uh, suppression of information. Um, sexual assault and suicide are two of the public health issues that the public seems to be most misinformed about. And sexual assault, we still have to convince people that it's not a stranger that's going to rape your child. It's somebody who knows your child. We're still trying to convince the public that what sexual assault actually is. And, and part of that problem is because the media has done a bad job covering it. And while the, the, the rules that the media has placed on itself voluntarily about withholding names have been well-intentioned, they've actually led to really bad public health outcomes. So I'm not saying that we should just change those rules arbitrarily, but we should recognize that when we, when we try and create a suppression of information, that very rarely helps with educating the public around public health issues. So if you want to change public understanding, the first thing you have to do is focus on local television. That is the very first place to start. And that is because, this is a graphic um, created by the Pew Research Center. Don't look at the headline, look at the bars across it. Six out of 10 people get their information from television, and most of those will turn to local television, most often. So if you want to even understand what the media is doing, you have to look at local television, which is, um, as Beth said earlier, really hard to do because getting access to the scripts and looking at it as a data set is, is quite difficult. There's so many of them. Um, and they're unlicensed, I mean, they're licensed as broadcasts, but they're unlicensed as content providers. Um, after that, you would also want to focus on digital, I'm sorry, I dropped a word there. You would want to focus on digital publishers with new and young audiences, like BuzzFeed or Vice. And that's because when you look at this graph, um, while local television right now is the dominant provider of information for the American public, um, if you look at the trends for millennials, that is definitely not going to continue. So we're going to face a tipping point. Um, we're going to face a tipping point at some point in time over the next decade, probably, where local television and television in general is going to become much less influential. Um, but we are not there yet, and so we have an opportunity now if we, if we target local television. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the other thing that you want to do is focus on news consumers and their political affiliation. So um, we, did a store, we did a study last December where we um, asked people about how much they trust the news. Because, right, because this is another problem if you're trying to change public opinion is that, that um, overall trust in any authority has declined dramatically. It's certainly declined um, in journalism, and we talk about the trust problem all the time in my profession. But we're developing a little bit more of an understanding of that. And um, so this is um, by um, confidence in the press. So if you um, disapprove of Trump, um, if you disapprove of Trump, and you are asked um, how much confidence you have, um, you're much more likely to have confidence in the media. And if you approve of the president, if you're a supporter of the president, which is about 37% of the country right now, um, you have significant disappro disapproval and distrust in the local move news media, or in, in any news media. Um, the other really interesting thing about this in this study is we asked people, we asked, we, we actually asked people to put 
a tracker on their browser so that we could just see, at least in digital, how what they were consuming. And we were looking for filter bubble stuff. And when what we found was that they actually, most people consume actually pretty widely across the filter bubble. So while we've been really concerned about filter bubbles because of the Facebook algorithm, um, our research showed that, that people are actually getting beyond their Facebook news feed on a regular basis. That was reassuring. What was less reassuring was that um, we, could, we could divide people into categories of people who concern a low amount of information, a medium amount of information, and a high amount of information. And our theory was that if you consumed a high amount of information, regardless of your political affiliation, that you would have more confidence in the news because you were consuming more of it. And we found that that was true for Democrats and the exact opposite was true for Republicans. That the more information highly identified affiliated Republicans had, the less credibility they had in the news. And so if you, if you translate that back to this issue that we're having with, with a misinformed public and people who don't understand the relationship between um, mental health and guns and violence, um, you're talking to two different audiences and you have we and we are just now figuring out why that is and how to change it but these patterns are so deeply deeply um, prevalent in our in American society right now that it's probably going to be a decade before we significantly change them um, one of the things that we're doing is um, language analysis uh, around credibility because um, uh, the hypothesis right now is that, um, that when you're consuming information that the way words are used conveys bias and, and that consumers are picking up on that bias and, and therefore coming to conclusions about the, the purported facts that are included in the information and if um, if we can figure out a way to scrub the text of that, of the words that, that are, con are conveying bias unintentionally, because most of the people who are creating the content don't want to convey bias. And they believe that they've used a reporting process that, um, that, that counters the bias and creates accurate, factual, um, unbiased information, but if the word choice conveys a bias and that bias undermines credibility, then we have to, we have to figure out how that works, and we're still working on that. So, the third thing that you would do is focus more broadly on the common problems in the reporting process. And this is, this is sort of what Mark was alluding to. So, um, newsrooms, and journalists and reporters in particular um, have four particular points of susceptibility where they get information wrong. And the first is just understanding research and how it works and what it is. And part of that is because, frankly, I mean, a lot of you guys that were speaking this morning, you're all really smart, but I had trouble understanding what you were talking about, right? Because you were using really big, complicated words that are not accessible to the general public. Um, reporters have trouble grappling with, with those dense concepts and, and we have to figure out how to translate the research that we do have into more digestible information. Um, so we also have to um, make, that, make that information available. Um, there's also a ton of junk science out there and reporters fall for it all the time. Um, you know, somebody does a poll on something. Um, it turns out, and as, as you've already heard all day today, um, there's very little reliable data that is available right now. Um, all of the data sets have significant problems with them. Um, and because of the political climate, um, the government, which has a lot of data, is not making that data available. Um, so journalists struggle to find the type of data that they can make conclusive statements based on that data. And, um, and, and, and I think that as public policy experts, you can help them 
get to that information better. And if it were part of your mission to constantly be translating that data and getting it out both in front of journalists and the public, um, there would be a deeper public understanding of, um, of this reality that we're trying to make evident. Um, and then also, I think a lot of journalists are not aware of the political realities around gun violence and the, the long-term impact. Um, and what I mean is that um, the CDC has been um, prohibited from doing certain research. Um, research is not funded. Um, the research has to be privately funded. Um, and if that, if that story isn't told, then the public is going to say, where are the facts? And journalists are going to say, where are the facts? And the real answer is, well, we don't have them because there's no, re there's no money to pay for the research. Um, but, but that story has to constantly be told. Um, so that when journalists are covering this issue, they can say, you know, there are they can tell their audience there are limits to the data. Um, sourcing is another problem that journalists have constantly. Um, the, um, Beth, the, the, the sample text that you were using where you wrote it, the thing that was most real about that, I thought, was where you had cops commenting on somebody's mental health issues, right? Journalists do this all the time. They confuse experience with expertise, right? And so I see cops and school teachers quoted as mental health experts all the time. And that's because they're in the middle of the issue. And so journalists think that they have that they, have ex that they have expertise in something beyond what they have expertise in. And so I'm, co I'm constantly working with journalists to not discount the experience of cops and teachers and other people who are on the front lines of this, but to place that in appropriate context. So that when you're quoting a school teacher about violence, that you quote her or him based on that experience, not as a mental health expert. And then also go out and find the mental health experts who can then talk in, in regular English about the issues, right? And that's where the gap exists because reporters are operating for the most part on a very short turnaround time. And so getting the, getting the right experts in front of them is a big challenge. Um, and so you can help journalists recognize that difference, and um, if you are an expert, you can practice talking to journalists so that you actually get good at it, and, um, and then go out and do it, and, and find a way to get in front of journalists at the moment that they need your expertise. The other thing that journalists have to do is get better at gun facts. And that's because most journalists make really glaring errors about things like gauges and calibers and semi-automatic or fully automatic weapons. They get the words wrong. And what happens to people who understand gun facts when they see that is they dismiss all the other information. So we've done a lot of work and um, one of our faculty members created a website called coveringguns.com and it's the collateral that goes with training that we do on this issue. If any of you are interested, it's right out there on the internet waiting for anybody who needs it. And then this last one, political spin. I think helping journalists um, recognize political spin when it comes to conversations about this topic. Um, this is really tough. This is really tough, but I think the, the biggest solution for this is for public policy experts who have, um, have something to say to get their voices into the marketplace of ideas in ways that are both shareable and relatable, right? That means that you can't be publishing, I mean, you can publish 20-page white papers, but that's probably not gonna change public opinion. But if you can take those 20-page white papers and distill them into graphics and visuals and short videos and then get them out into social media, you're talking about like doing the work that PR professionals do um, and, and bringing that into, um, into the marketplace of ideas, which one of the miracles of the modern digital age is that that marketplace is really accessible to anybody who can create good content. 
And so if you can, if you can take the ideas that you have and this information, like, like I was tweeting out story ideas earlier today because, because what I want is for journalists to do this work, but you can do this work yourselves. You can get this work in front of journalists and in front of the public just by getting it out there. Um, and so, so creating that material. Um, it's not necessarily a no-brainer to create this kind of material, um, but I'm always asking, um, I, I work with, on the suicide issue, I work with a guy named Dan Reidenberg, who some of you guys, guys may have heard of. He works with the organization called SAVE. Um, and he's always running material by me, and I'm always asking him, Dan, would you share this on Facebook? And that's like the way to think about material that you create, is like if you would share it on Facebook so that your friends, your regular friends, not your professional friends, your regular friends would be interested in it, then um, it's, it's possible that that would gain some traction in the marketplace of ideas. So I'm gonna stop there and just go with questions. Um, is that okay? Yeah, okay, thanks. There are no questions. Oh, here we go. Do not move the podium. I'm gonna move the podium. Uh, no, 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 Kim gets mad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mess with number one, yeah. Right, because then we're going to a panel right after that and they get to ask more questions. Absolutely. So it's kind of silly for them to ask questions just of me. So, uh, you spoke of steps made towards targeting TV, but in the next decade, uh, what thoughts have been entertained on how to target the internet, particularly in terms of its speed in transmitting both information and misinformation? Ooh, so that's a really big question um, about um, how ideas, both good ideas and bad ideas, um, factual ideas and um, um, not factual ideas spread on the internet. Um, and, and I can say this, um, we are working um, both, one of the, at the Pointer Institute, we're the center of the International Fact Checkers Network. Um, and, and through that network, we're working with both Facebook and Google on this issue. Um, there are times when I think that, that those platforms and other platforms are really interested in solving this problem. And there are times when I think um, that they're not necessarily putting their full creative energy into solving this problem. This month I'm more hopeful than I was last month. Um, but that is, if we're gonna solve that problem, we have, to, th there are these giants of information. And those, those giants are going to have to, because it's, it's gonna take engineering. And so those, that's probably the toughest problem of all to solve. Um, you know, I didn't mention one thing that I should mention, and that is if our goal is to change public perception, one of the most effective ways to change public perception has nothing to do with the news media, and it's the entertainment media. And, and if you look at um, the issue of gay marriage and how much we moved as a society over 20 years' time, um, and, and you look at the causes of that, it has more to do with the entertainment media than it does with academia or the professional news media. And so, if anybody's got any Hollywood connections, that is the best place to start. And, and uh, actually, Dr. Jacobson, who I, th who I think left us, has actually been doing a lot around the uh, 13 reasons why slash 13 reasons why not debate. Um, you know, if I may, uh, you know, one question for I have for you is, you know, we've had reporting guidelines uh, around suicide. You know, essentially you said, oh, in the mm -hmm. 2000s. And I'm thinking, I remember that like the early 90s uh, being actively discussed. And I guess there's an adaptation cycle for uh, journalism standards like we have in, in uh, evidence-based medicine. Um, what helps those types of guidelines take hold? What gets in the way of them? Uh, you know, there's mention of a recent article about the Robin Williams uh, suicide and how that may have mm -hmm. been mishandled. So. Yeah, it's a lot harder to get new guidelines like that to take hold these days because of the diffuse nature of media compared to what it used to be, of news media. Um, I mean, when I came out of journalism school in 1988, 
I was told don't report on suicides, right? So that guideline existed, but so did all of the exceptions to that guideline. Um, these days, you know, when we look at that Robin Williams case, what we're specifically looking at is, um, and I actually I have the graphic somewhere on my computer, but um, you can see a spike in the number. So Robin Williams killed himself in um, August of I think 2014 or 2015. Um, and you saw an immediate spike in the number of suicides, and you specifically saw an immediate spike in the type of suicide that Robin Williams employed. Um, and that was, and, it, and it's not a super common um, means of suicide, and you saw this like dramatic spike immediately after that. Um, and so, so, so there's, there's a definite relationship between, and, and what you had with Robin Williams, it wasn't necessarily the news media. As much as it was, there was a, it was a law enforcement press conference where either the sheriff or the coroner was, was essentially reading the responding officer's report verbatim in a live press conference that was broadcast. And then from there, um, I mean, I always equate this to, um, I, have, I have three kids. Um, the youngest is a teenager, the older two are now in their early 20s, but when they come home, my sink is always full of dirty dishes. And I always have to stay on top of that first dirty dish, right? Because if there's one dirty dish in the sink, then everybody will use that as an excuse to not wash their dishes. Um, the same is true with these types of, of, of unenforceable regulations, right? The first, the minute there's a break in it, the, the news media is so competitive right now that, that everybody will break. And so, so, so we have to be super conscious as a community, law enforcement, public health professionals, um, journalists, um, uh, academics, um, we have to be super conscious of what are the things that le specifically lead to bad outcomes, right? It's not, it wasn't the coverage of his death overall. It was the type of coverage that focused intensely on the means of death. Um, you know, the, and, and I believe that the same is true of mass shootings. Um, we're, we, it, it's unreasonable to think that we would get to a place where we won't cover them completely. Um, because there's a public need to know what's going on. There's a public accountability. We have to know, can law enforcement handle this? Are they doing everything they can? Or, or are they making it worse? Um, can our medical institutions handle this? So there's so, many, um, there's so many reasons to cover it, but, but can we cover it in a way that doesn't cause more harm? Um, and, and I think um, some of Mark's recommendations are exactly what's also included in that um, document, reporting on mass shootings.org or .com. I can't remember which one it is. But, um, you know, do you, um, yes, you can leave the, the shooter's name out of the headline. Um, you cannot give him clever nicknames, right? Like, that's a horrible thing to do, and it definitely leads to contagion or copycat behavior. Um, you can, you cannot, you know, do screaming headlines with record number of people dead. You know, you can ab avoid the tabloid treatment. Um, and I think we should be very wary of um, journalists who go on television or in the newspaper or online and say, you know, we're not going to do that. We're not going to name this guy at all because we don't want to give him any more attention. Um, I'm highly suspicious that that is a, that they are that that they're. Well, I'll just say what I think. I think I think that's a publicity stunt. I think they're they're trying to zig when everybody else is zagging just to get viewers and to to build brand. I don't think that they genuinely are looking out for the public's interest in those cases. So, all right, I can stop. Good. Kelly, thank you. Thank you.